Hallelujah. Welcome to Equipping the Saints. This is a part of our division or our ministry of Rescue the Lost ministry. And Rescue the Lost consists of a diversified group of Christians, spirit-filled, spirit-led believers who are burdened for the lost. If you have questions, comments, or concerns, or prayer requests, you can phone at one 877 Six seven six two two eight eight, or you can Skype at C La Radio S C L A H Radio Number One. And if you have questions, comments, concerns, or prayer requests, you can email raise R A Y Z for the number four him at yahoo dot com. You can also join the Facebook page at rescue the lost ministry dot com. There's live chat on www soul winners with a Z dot O R G as well as Facebook and Spreaker, and you can also listen if you have a TuneIn app for iPhone, iPad, or iPod, and all other Android devices. You can enter CELA Radio, S-E-L-A-H Radio, 24 slash 7 in the search, and you can listen on a TuneIn app. Well, it's a cold, snowy night tonight, but hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I think the warmth of the Holy Spirit is here in this room, and I'm looking forward to... That's right. Our discussion tonight, we have uh, Brent Saba with us tonight, and he is going to talk about courage. And it took a lot of courage for us to drive here tonight. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen on these slippery roads, yeah. but we're trusting the Lord, and he has delivered us and brought us safely Amen. here. Amen. And I'm looking forward to what you have to share with us tonight, Brent. So I'm going to just brother. Uh, listen to what you have to say, and I might chime in here and there, but... That sounds great. Well, thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. And folks, glad to have you all listening in uh, on this snowy evening here on uh, on Monday night. So, uh, Mike, I spoke, I had the privilege of speaking here, about, I don't know what it was, maybe a month and a half, two months ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I recall the last time I was here and uh, we were dialoguing and talking on the program, we talked about cultivating a heart for the lost. That's right. I remember that. And that was a, a great discussion. And uh, just to kind of recap, you know, we focused on, hey, it's one thing to talk about how do you share the gospel with the lost. But before you talk about how you share, do you even care about people? Mm. Do we as believers in Jesus really even care about uh, people who don't know Jesus? And so mm. we talked about that. And uh, I really had a great time. And, and uh a privilege to be back here tonight and as mike shared uh you know we the topic for tonight is talking about courage Mm -hmm. and it does take courage to be a believer it takes courage to be a follower in jesus christ Um, especially today especially in today's day and age uh we see countless times in the bible uh stories of men and women who god had called for a specific time and purpose and it took courage for them to follow through. It took courage for them to be faithful. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the things in Scripture that, uh, quite frankly, I I really, uh, um, I don't know, it stands out to me. And I think it might stand out to me when I was in high school nearby at Leah Valley Christian High School. I actually got the uh, Courageous Caleb Award uh, in oh. college. I'm sorry, high school, rather. My apologies. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that here in the program tonight because I definitely, Mike, was not courageous Mm -hmm. when I first became a believer. Uh, I needed courage in the Lord, so we'll talk about that. Uh, The book that we're going to be in tonight is uh, 2 Timothy. So we're going to focus on 2 Timothy. Um, Where's that found? That's found in chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verse 7. So that's 2 Timothy. Old or New Testament? That's in the New Testament. Okay. You're going to be flipping past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll have a few more books. You know, you go past Ephesians. You'll go back, go past First and Second Thessalonians. Uh-huh. Then you come finally to Second Timothy. Is it before or after First Timothy? It's after. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So Second uh, Timothy chapter one verse seven. Now, before I read, I just want uh, for all of the, our listeners out there, I just want to uh, give a, a brief overview of this book and what's going mm. on, so you understand the context of what I'm about to read. Uh, Timothy was a young pastor of a church back in the days of of Paul. The, right after uh, Jesus died and uh, resurrected and ascended to heaven, 
Uh, the church was born in Acts chapter 2. Mm-hmm. The gospel, the good news of Jesus crucified for uh, and risen from the dead for the forgiveness of sins was being proclaimed throughout all of uh, Judea, Samaria, and it was uh, going to the ends of the earth. And churches were being planted. And mm-hmm. Paul, who wrote uh, 17 books in the New Testament, had a young protege named Timothy. Mm-hmm. I've heard he might, might have been as young as 16. He, yes, you know what? There's a lot of speculation out there. It could have been 16, 17, 18, but a he was very, man. he was definitely a young guy, absolutely. And so uh, Timothy encountered as a young man and as a young pastor unique challenges. But you didn't even have his chariot driving license. <laughs> because they drove chariots back then. They didn't have cars, of course, or airplanes or trains. Uh, but he was a young guy. Yeah, he may not even, who knows how young he was, but uh, he certainly wasn't as old as Paul. We do know mm-hmm. that. Now, Timothy encountered unique situations uh, as a young pastor. There was a lot of false teaching going around in the church. Mm-hmm. Like today. Like today. We we see that today in a lot of churches. We hear a lot of things that are often confusing. Um, we get a lot of different messages, a lot of different uh yeah, just messages that uh, are coming at us all the time. And the same thing was happening in the early church. So Paul was writing in First and Second Timothy to encourage Timothy to be bold, to have endurance, to be faithful in the face of false teaching. And Paul wanted Timothy to remain sound in his doctrine, mm. sound in his teaching. So amidst this opposition, Timothy needed courage. So Paul uh, opens up this book in in the first chapter, and he actually started with reminding Timothy mm-hmm. of his early days. Ah. He didn't just jump right in and say, mm-hmm. Timothy, uh, here's what's going on. I hear about this teaching, and, and you need to be courageous. He mm-hmm. basically started out by reminding Timothy of his earliest days of becoming a follower of mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. He talked about... Um, his grandmother, uh, Timothy's grandmother, and his mother, who Lois and Eunice, so mother, his grandmother was Lois, his mother was Eunice, how they would pass off the faith of Jesus Christ. To, what about Timothy's to father? Uh, well, I don't know about that. What do you think, Mike? Uh, my understanding is he was a, a Greek, because Timothy was uh, Greek. His mother, I think, was Jewish. I th- uh, no, maybe not. Maybe not. But I think his father is known to be an, an unbeliever. There's no evidence that he, Most, was, he yes. was a believer. Yes. In seminary, we talked about this a yeah. lot. And um, that was one of the things that uh, is unsure because his father is really never mentioned. Right. His grandmother, Lois, and mm-hmm. his mother, Eunice, were mentioned, but his father. So that is an intriguing thing. And so, uh, you know, for a lot of listeners out there and people out there in the world, they may relate to this, that they maybe never felt like that as spiritual father mm-hmm. uh, to really guide and direct them. But uh, that's where Paul that's was right. a spiritual father, if you will, mm-hmm. for Timothy. And of course, God the Father is our ultimate father, our, our heavenly father, our, our, Abba. Our, our Abba Father and our ultimate spiritual leader. Amen. And so in the early days of Timothy's faith, Paul reminds him of his family and the unique people, individuals that God placed into his life. And after he reminds Timothy of these early days and the people who made a big impact in his life, he says this in verse 6. Let's actually look at verse 6. Chapter 1, verse 6. And for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and Mm self-control. Let me read that one more time, that last verse. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We're going to camp out on that verse tonight. and uh, But I just want to talk about one thing here. Laying on of hands so there's no confusion out there. For some of you who are wondering, well, what does it mean? Uh, fl- fan in the flame this gift of God through the laying on of hands. Mm-hmm. Um we, you know, Scripture teaches that, um, you know, the Holy Spirit comes upon you when you believe in Jesus Christ. The very moment that you trust Jesus, His Spirit comes upon you. Uh, but there's also, uh, you know, sometimes where people in Scripture would pray. Uh, they would lay hands on one another. 
you anoint the sick with oil, you pray for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, You anoint and you pray for empowerment in the spirit, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, tonight about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know, Mike, when I, countless times actually over the years, when I was in Philadelphia overseeing a ministry down there, when I was in college doing some ministry, uh, when I was down in Dallas at seminary, there were so many different times I was part of groups or even myself being Mm -hmm. prayed for where I had brothers and sisters reaching out, laying their hands on me, and praying for my, for my ministry. Right. And I, I think that brings an important point out, this idea of laying on hands. Now, there's different theological positions on what that actually means, but to me, it's somebody who is saying, an individual, in this case, Timothy, who receives this laying on of hands, he's identifying himself with a group of believers. Right. And there, there is no such thing as a lone wolf Christian we're called to be identified with a group of believers, and that laying of on hands is symbolic of that. Right, absolutely. So, um, so I, you know, and the reason why I pause, Mike, actually, to mention that is because I don't want our listeners tonight to maybe think that you know salvation comes. Mm. You lay your hands on someone, and someone's saved, or you lay no. your hands on <laughs> someone, and that's what, how they receive the Spirit, uh, folks. The Bible makes it very clear that. Uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord, uh, that Amen. you uh, confess your sin, you turn from your sin, and you trust Jesus Christ by faith, and the Spirit of God comes upon you. Um, and we see that uh, many times in Scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just wanted to uh, camp out on that just for a couple minutes. But the main verse I want to focus on tonight again is this idea of courage. And it says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear. Mike, when I first became a believer, it was in November of 2001. And I got to tell you, when I, that night in November, November 18th, trusted Jesus Christ, I knew my sins were forgiven. I knew Jesus Christ was my Savior, who was God, born in the flesh, died for my sins, rose again from the dead for my sins. I had no clue, Mike, what my future had before me. Mm -hmm. I knew I was starting fresh. It was a whole new slate. A new creation in Christ. I was a new creation in Christ. The old was gone. The new had come. I am a child of God. I am I am more than a conqueror. Uh, mm-hmm. Death had, has no victory over me anymore. I know if I were, were to die, I'd be in the presence of the Lord. And so I understood these truths, and I was celebrating in my spirit. But, Mike, I, I have to tell you, for, my goodness, let me see, November, December, January, it was probably, I want to say, February of 2002, mm-hmm. so probably a good three months later, until I finally had the courage hmm. to tell anyone wow. that I was what had happened in my life. That three months prior, I trusted Jesus Christ. Hmm. Inside for three months, here I am. I'm reading scripture for three months straight. I'm going home. I'm diving into the Word and I'm praying and I'm confessing my sins. And the scripture is so alive, so real hmm. as the Word of God is alive active in my you know as it is and it was definitely in my life the spirit of god was just showing me sins in my life that i needed to to confess and walk away from Mm -hmm. i was walking away from old friendships and you know surrounding myself with believers and and christians who i knew uh would be helpful for me Mm -hmm. as a as a new baby in christ to grow and during all of this amazing change which was so positive i didn't have the courage and so why is that you know what for some, I can't really put a put a finger on it, but my best guess would be I just had fear. Mm-hmm. I had fear that I didn't know what to say, how to say it, what other people were going to think of me, if I were going to screw up, if I was knowledgeable enough to explain it. All these different fears that was getting in my mind. You and think that you think fear came from the Lord or from Satan? <laughs> it was definitely not of the Lord. No, <laughs> because it says right here that uh, God did not give us a spirit of fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I remember though. I, I got to tell you, I remember one night I was praying. I was as I was falling asleep, and I said, "Lord, you've changed my life. Mm-hmm. Please help me to tell other people mm-hmm. about you, and about what you did on the cross, and how what you've been doing in my life, and how you're changing me." And the very next day, and I might have said this on a program, you know, a couple months ago. I don't know if I have, so forgive me if I'm saying the same story, but it's a fantastic one. I literally uh, left left the class. It was like science class or something. And uh, here I am. I, I go into the, the men's restroom. Here's all the 
you know, a lot, bunch of my buddies I built friends with at the Christian school. You know, I'd only been at the school for about four months. And I said, okay, this is it. And, and courage came upon me. Mm-hmm. And I can't explain it in words. It was just the Spirit of God Amen. gave me courage. I prayed the night before, mm-hmm. here the next day. Um, I had this opportunity. That was the first time I opened up my mouth to tell anyone about Jesus mm-hmm. Christ and, and the gospel and my testimony. And I never looked back after that. All of a sudden, I just started, you know, I'm going and playing basketball in the basketball court, telling guys there, I'm going to the grocery wow. store, family, friends, acquaintances. I mean, homeless people I'm running to on the street. I mean, anyone I'm just, anywhere I go, I'm just telling people about, about my story. And the more I told my story, the more joy I had, mm-hmm. the more courage I had, the more confidence I had. But it all started with one night when I just prayed and asked God for that courage mm-hmm. to open my mouth and tell someone verbally about what Jesus did in my life. I would say God answered that prayer <laughs> pretty spectacularly. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, uh, you know what, let's turn to Acts 1.8 because I want to talk about the idea of power that is needed uh, to be courageous in sharing the gospel. So let's uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 1.8. And Mike, can you go ahead and read that for us? Sure. Now Acts, let's see, New Testament. New Testament. It's after Matthew, Mark, Mark Luke, Luke, John, John and, and Acts. And Acts. And it's, right. just, it's really the history or the story of the early church. So 1.8, right? Yes. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, Mike, it's, it's fascinating when you pause and you look at the Bible, you read the Bible rather, and you think the very men that we read and women that we read in Acts who were bold for mm-hmm. Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, before verse 8, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 1 up to Acts chapter 2, here were the disciples. Mm-hmm. In an upper room, almost scared. They were terrified, yeah. Hiding. Yep. Jesus uh, appeared to them. He, he was. He, he walked with them. He appeared for 40 days. Then he ascended into heaven. And as Jesus ascended, he said, But power will come upon you to be my witnesses, essentially in the city you live in, to the nation that you live in, and eventually to the ends of the earth. The good news of Jesus would be spread. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here they were. They were not spreading it. They were not sharing. They were not proclaiming the ends of the earth. They were not going on these mission trips. No church had been planted. Mm -hmm. They were all gathered in one room, essentially doing nothing, going nowhere. The gospel is not being spread. Now, what was the difference maker? Jesus said, power will come upon you when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Mm -hmm. and you will be my witnesses. So then we read in Acts chapter 2, and I won't read it for you. I won't read it, but I'll just, we'll just kind of talk about it. In Acts 2, just the next chapter, we see that the Holy Spirit came upon them, upon the disciples, and they proclaimed the gospel. Hallelujah. They had boldness and mm-hmm. courage when the Holy Spirit came upon, upon them. them yeah. And so a major difference maker in courage and being courageous as a Christian is the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And I want to remind our, our uh, listeners out there tonight, if you are listening and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's right. You have the capacity to be bold no matter what your circumstance or situation. And, you know, Mike, we were talking about this earlier just before the program. Being courageous doesn't just have to do with witnessing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just have to do with sharing the good news of Jesus Christ's Although I think we all could agree that sometimes that can be a very intimidating thing. Sure. Fear is probably the biggest hindrance. Fear, fear is almost always the hindrance that comes in. But often, Mike, you know, fear also creeps in. I know for me, it can creep in to other parts of my life. Sure. And so God has given us the ability to have power and courage. Just like the disciples in Acts chapter 2. And mm-hmm. Jesus proclaimed that in Acts one eight. Just like Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 7, where Paul says, God did not give you spirit of timidity, but of power. Mm-hmm. We have the ability to have power and courage no matter what our circumstance. Mike, it could be finances. That's right. You may feel like, how are we going to pay the bill? Uh, <clears throat> our car broke down or we need a new car. How are we going to pay for a car? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, it could be the next meal. 
uh, clothes on your back, who knows what it might be, maybe uh, repaying a loan. How am I going to be able to pay? Mm -hmm. It could be relationships. Um, I have a tough relationship maybe with a family member or a coworker or, or an acquaintance, someone that uh, I kind of know. And, you know, and you're asking yourself, do I have the courage to trust God? Mm -hmm. in this situation to do the right thing to do the, that, that God will <laughs> that, that God will answer my prayer that God is faithful that he loves me and cares for me more than I'll ever know and that he uh, he's got it that God's going to make sure everything's provided for that if I trust Jesus and do the right thing mm -hmm. as we so often say often at uh, church uh, trust Jesus and do the right thing do do what's right that God's going to take care of you mm -hmm. and so it takes courage to uh, live life period but especially live the Christian life because there are so many different things in the world that often come our way mm -hmm. and we need courage yeah. daily I was thinking you know when Jesus was arrested you know at the end of the Gospels and uh, all the disciples fled they all, they all in fact it says one of them ran away naked yeah he he was yeah. so scared That's they right. just they left even his clothes behind and he and they just took off but then in Acts 1, when the Spirit comes upon them, you see that they have this boldness and this courage. And they're, they're able to proclaim the Word of God, do things that no ordinary man could do. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that they're right. able to do these things. That's right. And, you know, uh, I'm actually just looking here for uh, Peter's speech. But uh, Peter stood up oh, yeah. uh, in Acts in front of... Uh, Acts chapter 3, verse the, uh, 11. Where he's, the, he's, the, the religious leaders oh, proclaim yeah. the gospel okay. to them. I think that's Acts 5. So let's right. let's go ahead and turn there. But there are so many acts of courage uh, that you see in Acts. Uh, that, that's actually that Acts be, 4. That we can glean from Mike. Do you have that? Yeah, Acts chapter 4, where you, where you see Peter, you know, he, he's standing up against the religious authorities of the day. It'd be like, you know, me standing before the Supreme Court, so to speak, and you know, arguing a case and trying to show these learned justices who know everything about the law uh, why I'm right and they're wrong. Right. And and boy, I would be shaking in my that boots. That could be very intimidating. Very intimidating. Yeah. And Peter is standing up before these religious authorities, and he's able to just very confidently proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. And it's just amazing the difference uh, in his demeanor and his attitude and his speech. You know, pre pre Holy Spirit versus post Holy Spirit. You know, Mike, and there's a verse right here I want to read. Uh, Acts four thirteen. Okay. Now, when they, meaning the religious leaders you were just talking about, mm -hmm. saw the boldness mm -hmm. of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, right. they were astonished, mm -hmm. and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's right. The presence of Christ um, gives us a boldness mm -hmm. to proclaim the gospel fearlessly. So do you think that, you know, I'm thinking about your history, you're talking about the first three months of your salvation experience, you were fearful. Yeah. But it, it kind of reminded me of Paul in a way, who, remember when Paul was knocked off his horse, he was blinded. Yeah. Yes. And then it says, I consulted with no one in Galatians. It says, you know what? That's right. And I went into the regions, and he, he just spent some time trying to sort things out, trying well, to... 14 years. Four, he spent 14 years, not 14 three months. 14 years. That's longer than I've even been a, a believer, a Christian. I've been but a Christian I, I'm just 13. wondering if, you know, you yeah. spent all that time, because you said you had this hunger and thirst for Scripture, oh, and, yeah. and you were praying, and you were just really kind of getting to know your Savior in some greater ways. And I wonder if that three months wasn't a very healthy three months because it, it gave you was. that opportunity. Oh my, yes. you, you knew who Jesus was. Yes. You were like these Peter and John. They had they knew who Jesus was. Absolutely. And they had spent time with, with Jesus. Jesus. Right. That's right. And I spent time with Jesus in that, that three-month period of time just daily being in the Word, mm -hmm. reading the Word, praying through it, asking God for understanding, uh, renouncing my sin, um, asking a lot of the... Uh, uh, believers, Christians at my high school and at church and teachers, you know, questions about uh, the Bible and their faith and just just hungering and thirsting after the Lord. But 
I still didn't have that boldness. And it was just that night when I prayed and, and it's just the spirit came upon me and gave me the ability to have the boldness and the clarity mm. of mind to proclaim the gospel fearlessly. Mm. But it, but you, but you're right. Spending time with Jesus, as mm. we see here in Acts four, thirteen, and mm. remembering that, uh, in a couple of chapters earlier where Jesus reminded the disciples that power will come upon you when the Holy Spirit comes yeah, did, and did you'll you, be my witnesses. You know, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, he told the disciples, he said, go into Jerusalem and preach the gospel, start new churches. No, he said, go into Jerusalem and wait yeah. until the Holy right. Spirit comes upon you. And so, you know, he ascended 40 days after uh, he rose and then 10 days later, on the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, is when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So for that 10-day period, they were in the upper room, and it was a 10-day prayer meeting. Can you imagine what that was like? That's Ten, incredible. 10-day prayer meeting. Yeah. You know, and they were just spending time with Jesus. Preparing. Uh, preparing, re probably repenting, probably you know, meditating on scriptures. I know they, they replaced uh, Judas during that time. You read Peter said, we need to find a replacement for Judas. And they right. they chose uh, Mattathias, I think it was. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Matthias. Matthias. Yes. yes. And so it was during that time, during that 10 day interval that they were told to wait. And I think sometimes maybe, this is just a thought, maybe sometimes we're fearful because we don't spend enough time with our Savior, yeah, learning Him, learning who, what His passions are, what His desires are. So, a couple of things that we can gather here, Mike, as we're discussing is, you know, spending time with Jesus, mm -hmm. in prayer, the Word, fellowship, is essential to being courageous in this Christian life, mm -hmm. and also realizing that that courage, coupled with time with Jesus, ultimately comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And the Holy Spirit already lives inside of you. If you trusted Jesus and mm -hmm. you're a believer, that Holy Spirit, the same, this is the most mind-boggling thing, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead mm -hmm. lives inside of you. Amen. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Jesus it, said, it's to your advantage that I go away because then I'll send the other that's right. counselor, the counselor, the Holy Spirit. That's right. And so God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Mm-hmm. Or of fear, but a spirit of power. And then Paul says, not just power, but love. Mm. So what does love have to do with courage? Well, that's a great question, and I'm glad that uh, all of you out there are asking me, what does <laughs> love have to do with courage? I know power does. Sure, that makes sense. Right. I need power to be bold, power in the spirit. Mm -hmm. That makes more sense to me. But Brent, sure. Mike, what does love have to do with courage? Well, let's take a look at Jonah chapter 4. Okay. So, Mike, let's turn over there. Jonah, Jonah chapter 4. We're going to go to the Old Testament tonight, Old folks, here. Old Testament, okay. So I, know it's, Jonah. I know it's after Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, yep. Obadiah, Jonah. Am I, am I right? Yep, you're right. Okay. You're right. Yep. I made it a point to try and There's a lot of, memorize uh, these books. There are a lot of uh, what they call the minor prophets. Right. And so often that's uh, not minor because they're less important. Just no. minor because the books are shorter. That's right. You have your major and minor prophets. The major majors are just longer books to read. Uh, the minor books are often like Jonah, just four chapters. Right. So here we are in Jonah chapter four. And uh, Mike, can you go ahead and read um, verses ten through eleven? It's the last two ch uh, verses sure. of chapter four at the end of the book here. But the Lord said to Jonah. You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh, that was the city he was preaching to, has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? You know, that's great. And this, this to me, Mike, really hones in on God's love for mm. the lost. That's right. For people. These people had no concern for God yeah. whatsoever. They they were blind to the truth of God. Mm -hmm. They were blind to the truth of that Jonah was supposed to be the messenger of. 
Mm. Jonah, God wanted Jonah to go to a land, a city of lost people, mm-hmm. and be courageous, mm-hmm. but also have compassion for these people. That's right. To love them enough to tell them about God. Mm-hmm. And Jonah, as we read throughout uh, I, I love chapters the one through Jonah four, it's, it's, like, it's yeah. like God tells Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go east to Nineveh yes. and preach to the people and tell them they need to repent. And then the next verse says, Jonah went west, west. <laughs> away from the people. Cause, the opposite cause, direction. Because he didn't want to do it. He did not want to. And often, actually, in, in the Bible, um, there's some, some symbolism a little bit, I guess you can say, but... Uh, anytime the Bible in the Old Testament referred to going east, it often meant going to a wicked land, uh, going to an, a place that was ungodly. And so Jonah knew going east. Now, I don't want us to take that out of context and think, oh, okay, if I live in uh, Ohio, Pennsylvanians are, you know, or if <laughs> I live in Pennsylvania, you know, New Jersey, New Jersey, evil. and if New Jersey would think the same in New York City, right? right? Now, I don't want you folks to misinterpret what I'm saying tonight, but there is just a little bit of symbolism here in Scripture. But Nineveh was east, and Nineveh was an ungodly city, people that were very wicked. They would I don't even want to necessarily go into it tonight, but they definitely did not know the Lord, and they, had, they were compassionless mm-hmm. for people, even their own people. And so Jonah knew that. Jonah despised that. And quite frankly, I think Jonah was scared. Mm-hmm. I think Jonah lacked that boldness, that courage, that empowerment that we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. And he definitely lacked love because he went the opposite direction. And we read the story how he went on the ship and eventually, you know, there was this great storm. All the sailors were scared, intimidated. Finally, they find out Jonah's fleeing from the presence of God and fleeing from the command of God to go proclaim um, his message to the Ninevites. Jonah was thrown overboard, f- swallowed by a large uh, fish. We don't know what it was. It could have been a whale. Uh, but some large fish swallowed Jonah, and he was in the belly of the whale. Literally now, folks, we're not just talking symbolism here. Mm-hmm. Literally, this man was swallowed, and three days later, he was on the land. He cried out in the belly of the whale and said, Lord, you he know. Repented. He repented. <laughs> he, and he said, please, spare me. And finally, the whale or the fish gave him up, and he was on land, and he finally went to Nineveh. Yeah, now, I wonder how many times we are in the belly of the fish because we're disobedient to God. You know, so many times. Uh, I how many? I am. How many times there are the storms of life, mm-hmm. and you feel like there is literally no way out? I am swallowed by this circumstance, mm-hmm. and it seems hopeless. It's a dire situation. And then we cry out to the Lord. You know, not to go off on a tangent, but you're right, Mike. I mean, 9-11. How many churches were flooded mm-hmm. for the first six months after 9-11? Now, I know that was a long time ago for, for some uh, the listeners out there. I was I was uh, probably 16. I was 18 when, when that happened. I remember uh, the churches were flooded because right. America was in the whale, if you will, at mm-hmm. that point in time. It was very... Uh, unpredictable circumstance very vulnerable right. circumstance mm-hmm. and people finally fled but how many times do we wait until we're in bad situations to finally cry out that's right and god's waiting all the time you know, he's, he's that's right all the time and only and you know what it's interesting because if jonah would have just obeyed to begin with he wouldn't have gone through that situation mm-hmm. uh and so here is jonah going finally after this whole thing Finally, the whale or the fish gives him up. He goes east. He goes to Nineveh, and he proclaims 40 more days, and and Nineveh will be overtaken. And then he goes up. This is the craziest thing, Mike. The most This is the most hilarious story. Then he goes up on the top of a hill, and he just stares over the hill, waiting for, for fire to come down and for these people to be destroyed. I mean, can you think of, of, of a greater lack of love than waiting for God to literally destroy... 120,000 people and you're watching almost as if it's front row seats entertainment right and the cattle and the cattle as well that's right because god uh definitely uh, said that at the end of chapter four and so jonah was very compassionless and at the end god reminds jonah of his heart Mm -hmm. god's heart Mm -hmm. for people 
That's right. And when you look at the New Testament and you look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus mm. came to this world to proclaim the gospel to all mankind. And Jesus said it's not the healthy who need a doctor, mm -hmm. but the sick. That's right. With the church, the church is not for a place that is for those who have it all together. It's for those who don't. Mm -hmm. It's not for the healthy. It's for the sick. And the reality, Mike, is we all are sick. That's right. We all have sin. Mm -hmm. We all need a Savior. And even if I'm a Christian and I've been a follower of Jesus for 13 years, I still need Jesus. Mm -hmm. I need Jesus just as much today as I did 13 years ago. Yeah, we need more. We need even more. <laughs> Absolutely. Perhaps in many ways, even more so. That's right. For for daily living and becoming more like him. And so in Matthew 22, Jesus, uh, I'll just, I'll just kind of uh, say it here. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus, you know, reminds his listeners that uh, loving God and loving people are the two greatest commandments. They they basically sum up the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. And if you're out there and you're listening and you're saying, well, what's the message of the Bible? What if Summarize it in just one sentence, if it were possible. Well, Jesus actually does do that for us. He summarizes the entire message of the whole scripture with this. Love God, love people. Mm -hmm. And the question is, folks, and if you're a believer and you're a follower of Jesus and you're listening, do you love people? Mm -hmm. And this is what we talked about when I was in the program the last time was cultivating a heart for the lost. It's one thing to talk about reaching the lost, being witnesses, Acts 1-8, the power will come upon you to be my witnesses. Mm -hmm. But we can't first be witnesses until we love the lost. Yeah. Maybe it would be good to talk about what biblical love is because a lot of people think, I just don't have the feeling for that person or for that group of people. Right. I don't have the I don't have a good feeling towards them. So how can I love them? Where the Bible uses a different concept for love. Am I right? Yes, it really does. It uses the concept of uh, in the Greek called agape. Uh, there is phileo. There's three different types of love actually in uh, the New Testament. There is phileo love which is brotherly love. Like Philadelphia. Like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Uh, there is uh, eros love, which is uh, a physical uh, type of love between like a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. And then there is the third kind of love, which is agape love, which is God's unconditional love. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do something for me to be loved. You don't have to change for me to be loved. You don't have to be the kind of person that I expect you to be. Look or talk or act or think at all or do something for me. Any of those things. There is no string attached as you are with all of your sin. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what God the Bible says? Uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's right. While we were, we were yet sinners. And God Christ demonstrates his love towards us in this right. while we were still sinners. Right. Christ died for us. Romans five eight. He didn't say, you know, clean your act up first. You know, get yeah. yourself, you know, cleaned right. up and get rid of all that sin. And he said, while you were sinners, he demonstrates his love. He died for you. That's right. And we were actually God haters. Yeah. Until he, by his spirit, by his power, called us into that relationship That's with right. him. That's right. And it's all based on his love and mercy. I remember when I was in Philly uh, and I was pastoring down there. I had Mike, oh my, so many times there were people that just came walking by the church and they for lack of a better way to say it felt like they were not worthy to enter into the doors of the church mm -hmm. to go to church service and I had to and, and believers at the church we had to tell a lot of people on the streets who were curious mm -hmm. but felt ashamed mm -hmm because of their sin or their lifestyle right. or whatever it might be. My sin's we, too big, God can't forgive it. Absolutely. They felt like they had to change and stop uh, being who they were or whatever it was, stop their sin before they could go to church and hear the word of God. And we said, no, the, the Jesus and the gospel and church and, Christ, and being a Christian and the message of Christianity, it's all about who come as you are, just mm -hmm. as you are, to to God, and God will do the rest. No. You don't have to try and change and then come to God. 
Did you do that in the inside the church or outside the church? Both. <laughs> so you told people who felt unworthy. Yes. God loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Here's the avenue to God through Jesus Christ. That's right. But you know, you had it was pretty dangerous down there at times. It was. You it know, was. And, and it did take courage. And it took a lot of courage. It took courage. Where'd you it get took, that took boldness? <laughs> Circling back. Uh, it did. It took courage uh, because there were many times when it very easily could have been an intimidating situation or circumstance. And I do remember one uh, time in, in particular when we were short on dollars for an event with the church and God basically put on my heart to go talk to the drug dealers and ask them for the rest of the money for this church ministry event. Hmm. Now, talk, that go? now talk about needing some courage <laughs> and some boldness. And uh, this was one of the, by the way, one of the worst neighborhoods in North Philadelphia. And so I walked down to the corner and of course I had a relationship built with these guys. I'd been there for four years. Um, but I walked down to the corner and I talked to these guys and I basically said, hey, we're short X amount of dollars. It was hundreds of dollars. I said, I really believe God wants you to give us the money right now, right here. <laughs> and uh, uh, the guy who, I guess you could call him the GM, who, who was the general manager of that particular drug corner, the, the head honcho in charge basically said to me, okay, well, it's Friday. Come back Sunday. We'll give you the rest of the dollars, but here's a little bit up front. Some of the, the other guys overheard the conversation, and they said, hey, we want to help out the church, too. They wow. gave me money, and then, long story short, I went back two days later like he asked me to do that. So I went back, and he gave me you know, uh, 200 more dollars. And I said, do we have to repay you? Nope, we don't have to repay. Just go have fun. I said, I'll tell you what. When the kids come back from this conference, because it was for a conference, the rest of the mm-hmm. money, how about I have them come back and tell you what they learned about Jesus? Amen. And about the Bible. The guy said, deal. You don't have to repay us, but tell the kids to come back. So I had I had seven high school kids come back down to this drug corner, a very dangerous corner. Uh, their parents were fine with it. We talked to, the, to them beforehand about it. Mm-hmm. They went down to the corner. They shared about what they learned about Jesus, wow. the gospel. They prayed for these drug dealers. And it talk about courage on the high schoolers' behalf as well. Right. And so the whole thing took courage to go ask a drug dealer for money for the church and basically say, well, this is basically what God wanted me to do. So absolutely, power, courage. There are moments when God calls us some, sometimes to do seamlessly. Uh, it may seem like uh, it's a crazy thing, but God asks us to be faithful, to trust him, to know that he's going to take care. But mm-hmm. it, it does take courage and love to love people, just like we were talking about just two minutes ago with inside or outside of the church. People need to know mm-hmm. that God loves you just as you are. But not only do people need to know that, but that is how, Mike, you and I are to be living daily. Because as Christians, we are little Christ, little Christ, Christ-like. We are to reflect Jesus Christ. That's right. Imitators of Christ, as Paul says. Mm-hmm. So in being an imitator, part of that, a huge part of that, is loving people the way Jesus did. Mm-hmm. Now, I was thinking about fear and um it says in you know we're reading god does not give us a spirit of fear but of love of power and of self-discipline so you've talked about you know power we can see where you know fear and power uh, you know are kind of diametrically opposite opposed yes we can see where really even in love it takes courage maybe to love the unlovely that's right or to do it in an agape sense in the sense that this is a selfless act. I may not get anything out of this, but I still want to demonstrate love to this person. So that takes courage to do that, which is given to us by the Spirit. But let's look at self-discipline. You know, love, uh, power, yeah. and self-discipline. Yes. So how does that play into self-discipline? No, that's a great, great question there. Uh, you know what? Let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. All right. Let's go ahead and do that. So, folks, New Testament, we're going in the New Testament here. And, uh, you know, we were Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. He'll go through a few more. He'll pass the Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. He'll go all the way back towards the end. Timothy, finally Hebrews. Mm. So Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, let's look at uh, verse 6. Mike, can you read that for us? Sure. 
verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Boy, that sounds familiar. Yeah. (laughs) You know, that can be a very tough verse for some of us to hear. Because uh, some of our listeners out there, maybe you didn't have the, the best father or the best mother, the best parent, the best guardian, whoever it might have been who raised you. But the our father, our Abba Father, mm-hmm. our Heavenly Father, loves us, but he also disciplines us. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to get that word discipline confused because, you know what, let me just paint a picture. Mike, if I if I were a father, and I'm not yet, I have, I have a wife, a beautiful wife, a wonderful gift from the Lord to me, but we don't have children yet. We're newlyweds, year and about four months now. <laughs> uh, but at some point, if the Lord gives us children, blesses us with, with children, mm-hmm. uh, you know, say 10 years from now, my child is five years old. If I had a five-year-old and he was acting up, mm-hmm. d- destroying things, maybe he wasn't, he heard, picked up, bad language from preschool or something i don't know and i just didn't care i just said oh well let him do whatever he wants to do let him run around and you know break things and 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 not learn manners and respect Mm. and cleaning up and you know how to be polite and you know if if i wasn't being a parent that was showing him right from wrong Mm -hmm. and when he did wrong having some form of discipline not in a physical sense but in a and I sit down and give you a good lesson kind of a sense. Mm-hmm. If I didn't care about my five-year-old or say I had a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old and just let them do whatever they want to do, what kind of parent would I be? Would I be a good parent or a bad parent? Oh, you'd be, you'd be a bad parent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. If I, uh, and I think if you're out there and you have children, you're, you're a father or a mother listening, um, you know, certainly that makes even more sense to you because you are in that situation where you are a parent. And uh, Mike, uh, you have you have kids, and sure. you know, uh, you're a little older now. But uh, when you were raising your children, when they were uh, when they were young, did you ever discipline them? Um, yeah, <laughs> sure. And uh, did you find that to be no, necessary I'm... because you love them, or or be, or because tell us a little bit about that? Because you do love them, you want them to be doing the right things. Now, I I got to confess, I you know, I'm a I'm an earthly father. Yes. And so my discipline was not, you know, always 100% accurate, 100% right. Right. Because I'm an earthly father. But I know my heavenly father always disciplines in just the right way. Right. I was thinking of this story. Um, The guy calls the uh, police department and says, you won't believe what I just saw, officer. I just saw a man grab his son and toss him across the the way and and I just think that's that's child abuse yeah and and uh, so the officer questions him but here he finds out that this son was about ready to run into the street and get hit by a tractor trailer mm. so the Messing. father disciplined the son wow for you know the purpose of protecting him protecting him that's and right so a lot of times you know we're disciplined by God or you, you may discipline your child and they don't see the big picture. They don't. And the, sometimes the it's painful to them. Yeah. And it's the it's, same way. God sees the big picture. Yes. He knows what's best. Absolutely. He he has that broad. Uh, it's almost, I, I like I liken it to uh, a football game. If I'm on the sidelines, I see the football game from the sideline perspective. Mm-hmm. If I'm up in the press box, I have a panoramic view of the field that the players on the field may not have. Mm. Or those on the sidelines may not have. God has the big picture. He sees everything, and therefore his discipline is perfect Mm -hmm. because he not only knows all things and is all-loving and all-powerful, but he has our best interest in mind. That's right. But whenever we are disciplined by the Lord, Mike, it often seems painful. That's right. You know, if we just go a few verses ahead from uh, what we were just reading in Hebrews 12, 6 about God disciplining those he loves, let's look at verse 11. Mike, you want to read that for us? Sure, where it says... No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Well, I agree with that. Yes. <laughs> Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's right. And Hallelujah. so there is an end 
Uh, it's not it's not just an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And mm-hmm. um, God has given us a spirit of power to be bold. Mm-hmm. He's given us a spirit of love that we are to love people and, and love people in a, in a way that's different than the rest of the world loves. Where the world looks at you, Mike. They look at me. They look at believers. And they say, wow, they're different. They act different. They love different. What is it about them? Mm-hmm. And self-discipline, the ability to um, be disciplined. Because, you know, it. Um, and many times we read Paul use analogies of being trained as an athlete. Mm-hmm. And it takes discipline to be trained as an athlete. Paul's talking about godly training mm-hmm. to be a godly man. And again, we go back to Timothy's situation that in the beginning, beginning of the program we, we opened up. Uh, Timothy was a young pastor. He needed courage Mm -hmm. and part of being courageous as a young pastor is having the Mm self-discipline to be a godly man and and be able to navigate the church in a godly manner Mm -hmm. towards christ not away from christ in the midst of false teaching and it took discipline so what kind of discipline do you think timothy needed well i'm sure he needed to be disciplined in his prayer life needed to be disciplined in his doctrine Mm -hmm. needed to be disciplined in how he handled believers in the church uh, handled the false teachers and the circumstance there took there took an ability of discipline and how we handled things in a right manner mm-hmm. and that is what god has given us he has given you and i the ability to handle things in the right manner i have to say that just yesterday i didn't tell you this i was actually folks i was at Mike and Leslie's house last night, or uh, yesterday, my oh, wife and I, and we had a great time. Great time, yeah. Uh, we had several people over from the church, a wonderful meal, about six of us, seven what of fellowship. us. fellowship. Sweet Wonderful fellowship. fellowship. But I tell you what happened just beforehand. <laughs> okay. I didn't tell you this, Is this confession time? <laughs> it was rather interesting. We got home from church, Mike. I didn't tell you this. It's crazy. We got home from church. Some guy knocks on the front door of... Uh, no sooner do we park, we go inside the house, I literally take my jacket off... In my scarf, and there's a loud bang on the front door. Bang, 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 bang. I'm like, what on earth is this? So I walk over. Guess what? You took somebody's spot. <laughs> I took someone's spot <laughs> on the street. Oh, he that, we, like that. that we're in now. We're in Bethlehem, and it's in the street. Ron's a little narrow, and uh, it parked in front of this guy's house, and he did not like it, <laughs> and he let me know that he didn't like it. <laughs> and at that moment, I think it took love. And self-discipline, and even a bit of courage mm-hmm. to respond in the right manner. And I have to confess, I got very frustrated, very angry, because here's a man coming to my front door, disrespecting me at, my, at on the steps of my own house, mm-hmm. simply because I parked my car in front of his house, because there was no other parking on the entire street. Mm-hmm. I felt offended. Mm-hmm. I really did. And I had to correct my thinking. I didn't respond initially the right way in my in my spirit. Mm-hmm. So I uh, we had some words, and it was just you know I basically let the man say what he wanted to say. I gathered my senses, uh, walked down the street, and as I walked, I prayed and talked to this guy, and you know kept a good level head, and basically just uh, it took some self discipline mm-hmm. to contain my emotions, contain my feeling a bit frustrated with his way of interacting with me and a great deal of love mm-hmm. to love this this guy uh and not be um angry towards him that's right and so i i had a great conversation long story short the guy he apologized and and we made friends How and about that and uh you know i handled it in the right manner and it was great and i got to meet a new neighbor and um you know he said hey welcome to the block my wife and i we just moved in about two months ago so it was great to meet a new neighbor, and he introduced me to some of his family. Actually, turned up turned out to be fantastic. So you know what you were doing? You were witnessing. I was witnessing by responding in, in a way, in a biblical way. Yeah, and you so were witnessing. I have to say, I have to say, at first I did not in my at first you didn't in want my to spirit. I it was definitely not a biblical response in my spirit. And folks, I am a human being just like the rest of us. But the Lord, uh, you know, as I walked down the street, I just said, okay. Lord, help me to handle this in the right way. Mm-hmm. And it did. It took, it took uh, you know, power in the spirit to be empowered. It 
took love to love this guy in the spirit. respond in the right way in the spirit. And it took self-discipline to contain my mm-hmm. thoughts and my words and how I, right. how I responded to this. Right. So we have, you know, that's just life. This is the kind of stuff that happens all the time. We drive down the street. We may see something happen. Someone behind us may have road rage or mm-hmm. someone's waiting in line. They may get a little impatient. We have all types of things that happen, Mike, all the time that test mm-hmm. our responses. Right. And so how are we going to respond as believers? That's right. We, well, you know, we're talking about God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, love and of and self-discipline. self-discipline. That's right. And so all those things, you know, God gives us the courage or the ability and the power of the Holy Spirit to manifest those things. And just like he doesn't want to have to discipline us, he will if he has to, Yeah. but he wants us to take his discipline and make it our discipline. That's right. To be self-disciplined. Yes. And then I was thinking, you know, on the other end of this, you were saying you you shouldn't fear, you shouldn't fear, you shouldn't fear. But I think there's one thing we should fear. That's right. In the, in the right way. And, and it says in, in all throughout Proverbs and throughout Scripture, you know, the fear of, of the, the Lord, Lord is, the beginning is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom. That's right. And, you know, Proverbs one. we should not fear man, but we should fear God in the yeah. sense that we are fearful of him we reverence him we want to respect him we want to obey him we know that he is all powerful he could snuff us out in in a microsecond he is the creator of the universe and we humbly fall down before him and confess who he is and so we fear god but we don't fear man that's right and nor do we fear circumstances right in life as well mm-hmm. not just men but circumstances but right. but we want to have a holy, reverent fear uh, to the Lord. So as we're looking to close here tonight, uh, let me just recap on the verse we read. And we're going to talk about uh, briefly here just some application. How can we live this stuff? We've talked about the concepts. So Second Timothy one seven has been the main verse here tonight. And it, again, Paul says, For the Spirit of God, um, for the Spirit God has given us is not one uh, that makes us timid or fearful. Mm-hmm. But he gives us a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. And so, where do you lack courage? For the listeners out there tonight, where do you need courage in your life? It could be that there are people in your in your life that don't know Jesus Christ, and you've waited for a long time, and you just haven't shared the gospel. You haven't shared your testimony. You haven't reached out to lay your hand on them, on their shoulder, and pray for them. Maybe there's ways that you need to be witnessing for for God. Mm-hmm. Maybe for some of you, you may be witnessing, and you're courageous in witnessing. You're fearless and bold in witnessing. And you love this program, and you're saying, amen, amen, amen. But maybe there's an, another area of your life that you need courage. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's uh, some type of a a struggle with believing that God's going to come through for something else Mm -hmm. or that God could change a circumstance in someone's life or it could be finances, relationships. I mean, Mike, do you have any other examples of ways that, uh, that there are different environments or circumstances? I can think of people now who might be laying in a hospital bed and they're fearful of the diagnosis or they're fearful of what they've been told. And all you need to do, and I'm not saying it's the easiest thing because I'm not in the hospital bed there, but if you just cry out to God and lay all your burdens at his feet, he wants to to bless you. He wants to have that relationship with you. And if you belong to him, the worst thing that can happen is you'll die and go to heaven. Yeah. I mean. That's not a bad deal. That's a pretty good deal. Yes. To spend eternity (laughs) with your heavenly father. So there, you know, I'm sure there's people who are struggling with fear in those areas. Uh, maybe somebody's lost a job, lost f- a loved one, lost a loved one. They're fearful about what li- what's life going to be like now, right? And how do I go on in the situation? Cry right. out to God. He's right. there for you. He's waiting for you to come to Him. That's right. And we come to Him through Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to, you know, come into your life in the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that fear can turn into joy and gratitude and peace and just just an abundant life that God wants to give to to us. And so those may be some circumstances that might relate to some of those out there, but if you're listening, you're saying, okay, well, none of those really apply to me. 
just pause for a moment and think to yourself, where do I need to be courageous? And how can I be courageous? Well, number one, pray. Uh, something that uh, a godly man taught me many years ago was, um, I pray a prayer of faith in Jesus' name that God will answer this prayer in some way, shape, or form. So pray. Take a step of faith. Trust God. Just like me going out to, you know, that, that night I needed to go talk to the drug dealers. I mean, I, it took action to go and literally go and do that. Take that step of faith and trust God that he's going to come through. Uh, bring a friend with you. Maybe there's uh, you feel intimidated or scared and you're asking God to give you courage and power and love and self-discipline. Take someone with you. Share how you feel or maybe your struggle with someone else as well. Mm -hmm. Talk with someone. Don't just keep it inside. Ask for them to pray for you, to, to give you courage and to walk with you through it. Look back at other times in your life. Because I'll tell you what, Mike, when all of us, if, if a book were written on every single listener out there and you and I and... and Sam as well here tonight. If a book were written, I mean, it would be hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, well, probably millions of pages, and uh, worth of uh, of print. Mm. Probably millions of pages worth of print. If our day to day life throughout our uh, time here on Earth were written down, and how many times in my life, my thirty one years of living, have I found myself in a circumstance where I needed courage? And where it seemed insurmountable or something was causing anxiety or fear or worry or doubt and God came through. Folks, I want you to take a moment tonight and not just tonight but after this program, tomorrow and this next coming week. Think to yourself, just take time and take some, you know, some time to think about it. When did God come through? When did a circumstance solve itself? How did it solve itself? And remember that God has the ability to do that. And ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. So, just in closing tonight, will you pray that for all the listeners out there, that God gives you the power, the love, and the self-discipline to be faithful, to trust Jesus Christ no matter what circumstance you're in, that you would be a powerful witness through your words and through your actions, through your life. Amen.